Welcome back to Expert Instruction, the Teach by Design podcast where we dive deeper into the research surrounding student behavior by talking with the people implementing these practices, where they work, and with the students they support. I'm Megan Cave. Lately, we've been talking about adding student voices and perspectives to the way your school works. And it felt important that at some point we should talk directly to a student about their role in their school's decision-making process. Today is that day. I first heard about today's guest during a conference presentation. Someone in the audience had asked for examples of how student perspectives have been added to leadership teams. The presenters mentioned how they knew about this one student in San Diego Unified School District who had drafted a proposal to add a student to the district's school board. Now they didn't have a whole lot of a whole lot more information other than that, but I took to Google and before I knew it, I found myself talking with Zachary Patterson, San Diego Unified School District's very first student board member. Zachary's path to this position started when he was just in the seventh grade. His original idea was that the district ought to have a student advisory board. Well, one thing led to another thing, and eventually three years later, with the support of other students and district leaders, a role was added to the district school board and Zachary was elected. San Diego Unified School District is the second largest district in California, and it serves more than 100,000 students. Zachary is a senior at University City High School. His work as a board member includes successfully changing absence codes to allow excused absences for student mental health. He added mental health education as a requirement for graduation. He passed, he helped to pass the Students' Bill of Rights, and he's he continues to help San Diego Unified continue to meet its climate action plan and its goal of becoming a carbon neutral school district. So let's not forget either, don't get it twisted, he's a Californian still and he's living in San Diego, so you better believe he's also a runner and a surfer. I was excited to talk with Zachary and to hear about his experience as a student member of a school board in such a large district. I learned that it wasn't easy for him to find his place on the board, but once he did, The impact he was able to achieve, it's certainly going to help the next student elected to take his place. My interest and intersection to education really came in my seventh grade year. Uh I've been been a student leader on campus and I had been a student leader that people knew they could speak to. I was a person that spoke out when I felt something wasn't right. And I, when, because of that, people naturally came to me and said, hey, this is happening at X, Y, and Z. And I remember thinking the same issues just came up time and time and yeah. time again. And it didn't, it didn't make sense to me. So I said, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's something we can do about this. Maybe this system doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't make sense that I need to keep hearing the same things and we keep talking about them, but nothing changes. So I proposed the creation of an advisory board for the school district in my seventh grade year and the uh, addition of a student member to the Board of Education. That took me three years, a three-year campaign it took to do it, but I was honored to have that proposal passed uh, in October, September of 2019, and I was honored to be elected in October. Yeah, so you were, so you made the proposal when you were in what grade? Seventh grade. Yeah. Seventh grade, you thought there should be a student on the board. Yeah, and there should be an advisory board for the district. Just your Crazy. average, just your normal thing. <laughs> That's wild. That's wild. I mean, what a great, what a great thought to have at, in seventh grade. Um, but also, like, I don't know that I would have had the wherewithal to think well, not only is it a good idea, but I'm going to like put together a proposal. Was there anyone that was, was there any adult in your life that was like shepherding or mentoring or was this just strictly you? I don't think I was ever forced into it. I mean, I have a, I have a very supportive family. I have a a loving But there wasn't an adult who was sort of like, no, you didn't go and say, how do I make a proposal to the board? You just decided to do it and see how it I went. Just did it. Yeah. So I had a, I had a neighbor <laughs> that I had a neighbor that served on the county board of education. Uh-huh. I asked him. I told him my idea. Okay. He said uh, he said, well, just as I was explaining to you earlier, I serve on the county board, not mm-hmm. the city board. Uh-huh. So he said, let me forward you to my colleague on the city board. They for the that board member got it. He forwarded me to 
the assistant director of athletics, who at the time was leading student engagement initiatives. And from there, it was an arduous three-year process of back and forth. Why can't we move quicker? Why can't we do more? And it was really assembling a coalition of people that came together and said, you know, this is what we want. And then after a while, it really wasn't my idea anymore. It was kind of our idea. It was a So who a, else was there with you working on this proposal? Yeah, other students at my school, students from other schools. The, my final presentation involved some ASB presidents that were graduating at that point in time. They work, they came in. We had district employees review it. As I said, a lot of it was, it's a, it's a bureaucracy. A school district central office is naturally a part of a bureaucracy. So it can be really challenging to push things forward. And it yeah. was, and there's not really a, a culture. I, th I think we're a lot different than we were just six, well, almost six years ago when I, when I started. I think we're in a really a different place now. I feel like we've been working to get out of the conventional idea of learners and teachers and that maybe those, those things intertwine a little bit more, right? There's not older doesn't necessarily mean smarter, more experience, and younger doesn't necessarily mean shut up and listen. <laughs> Suddenly it's, it's maybe we can work together, maybe we can talk about it. And I think I came into a system that was beginning to see some of that, that was mm -hmm. starting to be uh, on the forefront of it. And I think I, I think I got to challenge to hopefully usher in what I think is really a, a transformation that we're going through right now. No kidding. So um, you got together a coalition of people. It made its way through and there you are. So you started out as a seventh grader doing all of this. And then by the time you were, uh, w was it an election or were you appointed? I was elected. So yeah. How did that work out? Election. It was interesting. The first year we had, we actually had six different candidates run. We were all from different schools. We are 16, 17 high schools in our school district, not including our atypical and alternatives. So we're, a large, we're California's second largest school district. Yeah. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of people that were eligible to run and to go in. And was it students that were? Students that were voting. Yes, voting. Okay. election. And obviously my goal, I'm, I think a big distinction, I'm not the student representative, I'm the student board member. And they're different because of the fact that a representative is someone that's there on behalf of others, but a member is someone that is not only there on behalf of others, but is actually in that formal enshrined role and a part of the operations. And I think that's a, and that's an important distinction that I know I work to emphasize and I say, hey, it's, a, it's important that we get that correct because it, mm -hmm. it means that you're a member, I'm a member, that way we come forward yeah. on equal terms. But yeah. this was an election of students and just like all of the other members of the school board, I am duly elected and I serve, my first term was a year and a half because it was a special, it was a special instance, but right. most of the time it's a one year term. So I'm serving my second term right now. Got you, got you. So what has, what was that first year like when you were, like the first time you sit down at a board meeting? Was it, what did, what were the adults' reactions, first of all, to this whole idea? Were they all, all for it in theory? And then in practice, did that shift at all? Or did you, did you get a sense that like, yes, I'm walking in as a fully elected member of this group and everyone sees me as such? It was a challenge. I walked in and the answer was not always yes. I walked in and the answer was, we're so happy to have you here. Oh, thank you for coming. And oh, so sweet. It was exactly like, yeah. so sweet, wonderful. <laughs> and it, yeah. was, it was tough because I was always different, right? I was never, I was never quite as good. My opinion mm -hmm. was never quite as important. At least it started that way. Sure. And a big part of it was finding, I mean, finding myself and finding who I represent. Uh, I'm always told, you know, regardless of everything that happens, regardless of how I'm treated, I'm elected to do a job. And at the end of the day, if I'm not able to do that job, that's on me. It really yeah. is. And what that meant to me was I needed to find a way to be effective, regardless of what was thrown at me. 
Mm -hmm. And I needed to find a way, whether that be to implement our school district's first student bill of rights, to implement uh, mental health days so students could have excused absences for mental health, passing a mental health curriculum, some of the probably my, my most my most proud accomplishment. I I do these things because this is what these what this is what students ask for, and yeah. this is what students want and need, frankly. And yeah. it was not easy to push these things forward. I remember at some of my first meetings, I would, and I mean, first of all, just getting in the door, right? So establishing, are we going to have, am I going to have weekly meetings with the superintendent, like every other board member? You know, that's something that you have, you have to ask for. You have to be sure that you get. And I was fortunate enough. I, I did start with that. And it was me really saying, no, this is, this is no joke. I really need this. I do to understand what's going on too. So I can be a full member of the school board. Mm -hmm. And the learning curve was tough. I was not given the same support. And even my first training as a student board member, I mean, all the other trustees were learning about the local control and accountability plan, community schools, some of the different California funding systems, whether that be Title I, whether that be the LCFF. And I'm out there doing a, a relay race with other students on yeah. uh, probably what would be taught to a, a student council leadership training. Mm -hmm. And that's challenging. That is yeah. really, really difficult. And it was from these experiences that because I've served as long as I have, and because I've been fortunate enough to, in the end, I'll have served for two and a half years, which is extraordinarily long for a student to be serving sure. on it. I've really had the time to grow into the role and mm -hmm. to discover this is how I can be effective. And part of it is playing a game, part of it is playing a game, right? If I don't, if I don't quite have the same say, if my voice doesn't count as much, it means that I need it means that my voice is only as strong as those that are willing to listen. And it means that I need to find a way to make sure that they hear me, that they understand me, building relationships, building trust, proving yeah. myself. Yeah. Do you think that the ways that you've been able to do that will make it easier for the students that come after you? Yeah. I think that what I've learned, I've really, really tried to write down and to remember and as I said I I found it I found it an organization because I identified three D's like we call them the three D's of student suppression delegitimization demonization and double standard mm -hmm. and you might recognize that it's the anti-defamation league's three D's of uh they use the three D's for anti-semitism very very obviously not the same issue, but the three D's are very standing in terms of power and balances that you see and what that looks like and I identified that these three ways were the were the ways that adult board members intentionally or probably most of the time unintentionally delegitimized the role and sought to diminish the importance of it. And I do think that in the methods that I've found to being effective, in the ways that I've seen that I can work my opinion, that I can move my opinion forward and that I can be sure that I am contributing, I think that. I think that in future years, students that will be able to use the resources of the California Student Board Member Association that will be able to see this can be effective. And my biggest hope is that I've shown that this role matters and that this is serious and that this role should be something that 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 you can aspire to, that you can that you can work towards because it is, I mean, right, with great power comes great responsibility. And I I don't I don't think I have I don't think I have great power. I don't, but I think I have great responsibility. And yeah. what that means is I want to create a community that every student feels safe in, that every student can be successful. And just as my district's mission statement is, we're talking about creating a, a world where every student can be successful, looking at creating a better tomorrow. What we, we look at is, I mean, we are the leaders of tomorrow, but tomorrow starts today. And it means that we're putting us in roles and influence and being able to effectuate change right now. We've been given a platform that students haven't had before. And, uh, and so clearly having your voice incorporated into what your board is doing um, 
is new and um, and it would make sense to me that uh, change isn't always easy for people. And so it makes sense that you would have to work to find your place um, and to have that place be accepted. Um, you've talked about um, uh, trying to make uh, bring student issues into what your board is make, is doing. And I'm curious how you pick what it is that you bring forward as the student board member. Do you, how do you talk to students and how do you understand what it is that across your district students are looking for? Because it's big, you said, your district is huge and you're one person. Yeah, it's true, right? One um, experience in your district. And so it's, I'm curious how you curate all of that information to bring forward something as an initiative as a board member. Yeah. yeah you're right, right? 100,000 100, students. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> a lot of people. It's That's a, a lot of people. Number. It's a big yeah. responsibility you have. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true. And I, I think about, and I feel, I feel fortunate to be able to be in a role to where I can. I can make that difference. I can make that change. Yeah. Some of the things that I've worked on, my original idea it was to create a student advisory board. That was, that was <laughs> right. the foundation. So, <laughs> right. It was, a little, was, it was a little smaller. Well, it, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe it was a bigger, bigger plan. But So, I mean, it's, it's gone from there, right? And I, I achieved that goal. We have a student advisory board now. We have a student advisory board that I help lead. I will tell you, I, operationally, it's been a challenge, but <laughs> I have been thrilled to hear students and to uh, be able to have that direct connection. So we have five mini districts inside our larger district. We call them geographic subdistricts. Okay. And those are what each of the five, those are who each of the five board members represent, different constituencies within them. So we choose students from each of those geographic subdistricts and mm -hmm. we come together and we convene and we call them. Are they elected or appointed? Are uh, they going to be appointed via an application process? I got you. I would I think it'd be cool to have an election. I think it would be really interesting. It would also be very logistically challenging. We'd need to, yeah. one of the things I'm pushing for, getting a staffer for student engagement, getting someone that can formally really help set the processes in this role. That would be beneficial, but so right now they're appointed okay. and they submit applications to participate in the advisory board and they help me bring forth the issues that students want to hear about most. And the other thing is, I made a plan for myself when I came in, right? So I went to one of the students and I said, I want to do this, I want to do this, and I want to do this. And then I was elected. So that, I think to some extent, that helps give me a mandate that sure. I'm going to do this and this and this. And some of those things I talked about, I really wanted to legitimize mental health. I wanted to work on implementing Holocaust education. I wanted to work on supporting equity and uplifting minority voices. I wanted to push for ethnic studies so that we have diverse representation in our curriculum. And I wanted to create processes that ensured that students were on all of our district advisory committees. And some of those are still in progress. Some of those have been completed, but mm -hmm. I ran on those. And when I think about the agenda that I set for myself, I always go back to what did I run on? And mm -hmm. those are the things that people want me to achieve. New things come up constantly. And we also have new student groups that go, that flow throughout the years. So right now we have a very, very strong mental health group called the Student Wellness Education and Resources Committee. So mental health has been a big focus of mine because I've had such clear access to students that are passionate about it. Mm -hmm. Students that come from all of the district, different schools that came together. So I help with that. I often help with environmental issues. And the biggest thing is I'm, I'm the go-to person for when students want to bring forth an issue. And beyond everything I do on the dais, most of my work happens off of it, right? I'm working more than 20 hours a week in a job that I don't get paid for. Wonderful. Um, great. Isn't right? that great? Great. Wonderful. Don't we love that? <laughs> I know. Uh, hey, hey, California, I'll put it out there. There's a, there's a ban. You're not allowed to pay me. It is, it is illegal <laughs> under state law to give me compensation of any, of any kind, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is unusual to say the least. I, I can't think of something more equitable than saying we want to uh, we want you to serve in the role, but we're going to take up your time and hopefully you can make it work. I can't think of mm -hmm. anything more equitable than that. <laughs> uh, 
but that's okay. I don't, I don't write the state laws. I just work. <laughs> you just work. I just work with what I have, right? I, I yeah. just play the cards I'm dealt. But yeah, so I work, when I talk about student voices, I'm looking at my student advisory board. I'm looking at who elected me, what I ran on. I try mm -hmm. to visit schools. It's challenging because I want to balance making sure I'm in school myself, but I also visit different schools. I was just at a high school this morning for a press conference. And some of the other things I work to do, I'll do some social media engagement. I'm not a, I'm not a huge on social media. I think it was one of my, one of more of my blind spots, but I mm -hmm. know it's effective. And when I have used it, I've been happy to see results. Yeah. Are you, um, oftentimes what I have found is that members of any committee, advisory board, student council, whatever, oftentimes these are, um, these are folks who are already involved and, um, and already want to have their voices heard and may not necessarily capture the voices of folks who are living a little bit around the edges and, um, and don't see themselves necessarily represented in the initiatives or the uh, perspectives that are coming forth from some of these places because they're just not represented on them. And so I'm curious what you think about that and, um, and whether there's a sort of outreach that you try and do beyond any of these other committees that you have access to. I mean, I know that, like I said, I get it that your district is enormous. And so it would be impossible to reach 100,000 students. But I do think that there can be times where, you know, the things that you're working on are not necessarily represented by some of the uh, the students that aren't on those committees that you have access to. So I'm just curious how you navigate some of that and if that's some, it's something that you're still working on. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Well, I think it goes to how do you create a pipeline of student mm -hmm. voice and engagement? Yes. We just, I, I really appreciated something my superintendent shared with me. They were talking about kind of the process of going through our budget and many people talked about mental health being important. And mm -hmm. when he went to review, looking at the budget, he saw that 4 million was allocated for mental health. And he went back and you know, he asked himself, if everyone says this is our number one priority, <laughs> if everyone says this is the issue we wanna work on, and we have a budget of over $1 billion, why is there 4 million going to mental health? Mm -hmm. and it changed to 28 million then, and it yeah. was bumped up a lot. And I like to turn back the question, I'm one person. Yeah. I'm one person that's a full-time student that is going to spend all the time I can, but I do have blind spots, sure. and these are some of them. And the biggest thing I can say is it can't always be my responsibility to, I can't do all of that outreach myself. Right. And what I'm pushing for, my final legacy in my school district, I'm asking for a director of student engagement. Someone that full-time, their job is to engage students, create a pipeline of engagement, mm -hmm. and ensure that these voices are being heard at the site level. One of the initiatives that I'm most proud of is I worked to get principal advisory committees at multiple, at, I tried to do most of our district high schools and we're working to get there. We have a few that we're starting right now. And what we've done is we've asked the principal to choose not, not necessarily the ASB students, now important to have ASB students as well, but also some, some other students, people that are non-conventional leaders, students mm -hmm. that might not be the, the shining star necessarily in the way that teachers see the shining star as. <laughs> right. And right. That, that also means people that don't necessarily shine out, people that are a little bit quieter. And yeah. what we've worked to do is ask our principals to come together and bring these students into a room and talk to them about these issues. So where do we want our, we have an extra $5,000 and we have to decide where we're going to put it. What do you want to do? 
-hmm. I serve on my own principal advisory council because my principal opted to create one after we worked to push that at a district-wide level. He invited mm -hmm. me to join. And I just got to sit through a discussion where we had a, a long conversation. How do we want to implement a gender neutral restroom? What, is, mm -hmm. what does it look like? The big question was, do we want to have it be locked with a key or do we want to have it be open? Some of the other schools got frustrated because it became a vaping bathroom. <laughs> and other schools, um, we had other issues and we came together and students were like, you can't have it locked. You single the student out then. And yeah. the administration goes, wow, I really did not think about that. Yeah. Thank you. And they changed. Yeah. And yeah. within, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a testament to the people on my campus and the environment that my principal sets for what student engagement must look like. And I haven't always had that experience. I'm very thankful to have it now. But mm -hmm. what that looks like is creating a community where people are heard, creating a culture where you know that you can speak up. That first day when we had that meeting, I'll never forget what a student said. Um, a student walks in and he goes, oh, I'm not supposed to be here. This is for the smart kids. No. And I turned to him, I'm, I go, what do you mean you're not supposed to be here? Sit down. Like, yeah. it, was, uh, it was a very, very interesting experience for someone to, for me to see that, for me to hear, wow, you know, he, this student did not feel that he was a part of this community. Right. He didn't right. feel valued. And that's bad. That means that we're not doing our job. I ran, one of the reasons I, I say that I worked to get here is because our school district and statewide, very similar percentages. In 2018, we had a whopping 29% of 11th grade students report that they feel that they have a meaningful role in the creation of their education system. That's not a lot. Incredibly low, incredibly yeah. sad. And the questions were, I feel I'm heard. I feel I get to be a part of making the rules of my campus. And that low number is a testament to our failure as an education system to tell students that they can be a part of our communities. And as you bring up, you know, that 29%, that a uh, big portion of that are probably these people on these advisory committees. Yeah. Are probably these people. I, I will say I chose to answer that but I did probably not you, Zachary. <laughs> I did not say I felt heard until I got on the school board. Mm -hmm. So all the way up, but actually, I think I answered the first time, even my first year on the school board, I think I still answered that I didn't feel heard. You're like, I still, they're still I not still, listening. They're still not, still not listening. Yeah, so even it took me that long to get yeah. to that point. But as you bring up, we have to strike a balance and we have to recognize that you, just like any society, you have people that, you have people that are leaders that serve in that role. But a big portion of a leader is being a follower, is being someone that's listening, taking a step back, understanding. I'm going to be honest, my best experiences in hearing students are probably on my own campus or when I visit school sites. It's yeah. really, really challenging to get someone that feels disconnected to show up to an additional meeting. I, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would nearly go to say it's impossible. It's just not, you're not going to be able to do that. The only way, and, and by the time you get them to show up to that meeting, they no longer fall in that category. Just by, by virtue of you showing, going to a meeting, it shows that you're a little bit more engaged in the system. Yeah. So that disengagement, it's talking to students. It is doing this day-to-day -day interaction. And I think definitely I know my peers on who visit schools. When I visit schools, I get the most, I get the most out of it when I talk to people, when I understand, you know, here is, here's what's actually happening on campus. Here's what students care about. And I will say though, the issues that I'm pursuing, I found a lot of similarities. And I do think that the agenda that I'm pushing is very representative of a lot of things that students do care about. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think too, the thing that, I, that I'm hearing from you over and over again, as we sit here and talk about what it is that you're doing, is that you have a really good handle on the, uh, the structure of the way that schools operate. So you recognize that you're only one person, but there are lots of people throughout your district who sit in roles that could affect change locally 
and um, and by organizing them, you extend your role as a student board member by asking the adults in the schools and in the local areas to collectively come together and bring together students whose voices may not be heard and to and to listen to what they have to say about their own schools that can then trickle themselves up to these higher levels where you're talking to principals or the principals are talking to uh, student advisory boards or whoever, you know? So your sense of the way that the, that the governmental aspect of how school, your school district works, it's leveraged well and as a way to get these, you know, additional student voices to be heard within your board decisions. I think that's really cool. I think it's really cool. And what you're doing is really cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I... So when is your when is your um, seat up? Are you done when you graduate? Or yeah. So uh, about for I think three weeks after I graduate, my term ends Ju uh, June thirtieth. The new person will be sworn in the following day, July. There, 1st. When do elections happen? The elections I'm aiming for March April just to give some time to train the student board mm -hmm. member who's going to take over to give them an opportunity. My excitement, we finally have an organization that trains student board members. So that's exciting. Now we <laughs> now we have a way to do this. Now we have an organization that's working on this. We also are going to have one in Oregon, which is exciting. So they'll be for Oregon student board members will have that as well. And I think this resource is going to be absolutely critical because a big part of this role is getting over how people treat you <laughs> is really upsetting. And I really think we've had student board members since the 1970s and there has not been a whole lot of progress to some extent. Mm -hmm. My school district, we have not, I'm the first one, but some school districts have had them since the 1970s. And mm -hmm. the, the utter lack of forward movement in the role just always shocks me. And it's really a testament to, once again, our inability to get past the traditional models of learner teacher. And we really stick to that. We hold it so near and dear to our hearts yeah. that people some for some reason can't move forward. But when my term's up on yeah, June 30th, I feel confident that I will have helped create a system in San Diego Unified that will allow for a student to be heard and to be seen. Honestly, I think you've done it. <laughs> I think you did it. I think you did it. I mean, you spent two and a half years within your district and you've, uh, the, the way that you've pushed people forward to listen to your opinions, to have things actually like become part of the way that your district does business are only going to serve whoever it is that follows in your footsteps. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to join me. I'm so excited that we got a chance to talk. Um, I only see good things for you after this. Thank you. 